thanks for meeting with me, man. I appreciate it. Like we were just talking before we hit record about music and we could definitely spin a thread there on our love of music. Uh, That's what made me want to reach out to you. Absolutely. We're comparing guitars and discussing whether a a belly plaster is really the perfect guitar for anyone other than a rock uh, country music star. Yeah, you know, I grew up in the indie world with like the Smiths and stuff and these people were playing tellies as well. So it's hard. It's hard. That's true. true. Okay, a little bit of respect back for the for the. Yeah, but I get where you're coming from, man. So (laughs) like, um, tell me about yourself. Like, I've I've obviously done some research and I saw like such synergy with your background, not just within music, but entrepreneurship and building a digital transformation. So tell me a bit about yourself, man. Oh man, where would you like to start? Uh, Wherever uh, you want, go far back as you want. As far back as I want. Hmm. Well, there's a lot of a lot of people talking about my early childhood, which I'm hoping to forget at some point. No, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, really, we were talking about digital transformation, so let's talk about the sort of latest stuff. Yeah. So uh, there's just a two big sides to my business right now, to what I'm doing. I can say personally, other than music is uh, we have a digital transformation agency. So we help people grow, we help people get efficient, we help people do innovation. So uh, on the growth side, digital marketing. So we have branding group, we have a website development group, and we've got a digital marketing we call it fractional digital marketing. Yeah. Uh, so it's fractional outsourced marketing. So instead of hiring a marketing person, you hire us and we're all the marketing people. And then we've got a, uh, a an efficiency group. So we build apps, we build web apps, uh, we build app apps, we build... Uh, ERP and CRM and all sorts of complex software integrations. And then we have mm. a technological infrastructure team. So a bunch of people who do coding and make sure servers stay alive. And then we do a ton of innovation stuff. You know, I'll, I'll tell you something. Yeah, that sure. I've heard of people I'm looking for right now, somewhere around here. Uh, we have a uh, a company that does IoT. So yep. internet. So we actually made a company called uh, Ubiquitous. We ran a Kickstarter. It was successful. We took a couple of years and uh, have a one inch by one inch by one inch cube that monitors yep. temperature, humidity, light, and movement. Nice. Uh, so you can sort of take the thing and stick it on a chair and get a text anytime somebody sits in the chair or uh, put on a door and count how many times the door is opened or say, it's only send me a text if somebody opens this door between this time, mm-hmm. you know, all cool concepts. So how, how are you going to, how are you going to monetize that? That's really interesting. Are you going to like do some integrations with things like upkeep or service max or something like that and, and try and like do that kind of thing? You got, so this, we actually, I think we were a little ahead of the curve. So we built that in 2017, yeah. uh, then finally got it to market in 2018, 2019. And then when COVID hit, there was no chipsets available. So we mm-hmm. kind of just put up, you know, to, uh, to, we stopped selling them publicly and just have now only doing sort of commercial work with them. It's great. Uh, so really the concept was, you know, as a company, we we're building all of these cool other companies and that led us to start an accelerator. So oh, wow. we, so we like, you know, uh, some of the more famous accelerators, like where, where Sam Altman from uh, OpenAI came out of Y Combinator. Yep. We're running Canada's version of that okay. called Rug Accelerator. And we've put, I don't know, 650, I think that's the number right now. I don't even know, uh, companies, startups, scalable tech startups through the accelerator and yeah. raised, I think it's $40 million in the last couple of years. That's amazing. Because um, like famously, Y Combinator puts in like 150 Um, So with on a safe note. So what are, what are you guys are raising this fund through LPs and then you're deploying capital into the startup. So how, how much does each startup get if they make it into the program? Well, no, so we're a little bit different. So we're an accelerator, not not doing, well, we're doing angel investment. So what we do is, uh, if you know this is a startup world yeah. in Canada, I mean, everybody defines it differently. So the beginning, you've got an incubator. So people work with, oh, I've got an idea. I want to be a startup, I, whatever. And we'll sort of incubate the egg and try to get you to minimum viable product, which yeah. is, this is the cool technology that we think we've got our first sale. The thing works. Might be a little like rusty in some parts, but we're going to work on it. And then that's where we come in. So we'll help you put a pitch deck together, put you in front of angels, uh, do the do the work of that. Uh, and right now, there's two sides to it. One is regionally. So we're helping Canadian businesses. And it's free. we just run people through and help them through the process and get them investment. And then if we like the company, we'll put an investment to safe into it. Safe. And on, on the other side is international. So we're actually in the world out there looking for cool companies uh, from companies, you know, from states-based companies, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Iran, like anywhere in the whole world that we find cool tech and mm-hmm. dragging passes to Canada and saying, look, we'll help you move here. We'll get you passports. We'll get you in. And we want to bring all the cool companies to Canada. Yeah, that's, mag- that's mega. And that's more than that's most funny. accelerators do. So um, what was gonna, I was going to say, like, so are you also sort of blending in a bit of Venture Studio with that as well? Because you guys have the capacity, it seems, to, to do a lot of that stuff. 
Yeah, so we've got a VC side to it. And so we'll make investments. I mean, I've been super active in the angel community in Canada. Mm -hmm. There's a famous group here called the York, uh, uh, that's a famous group, I can't remember the name, oh. York Angel Angels. Yeah. Uh, so that, well, I, I've been involved with them, I think, for six years. And I, that's where I started working with startups and then going, hey, these guys are cool, putting some money in here, putting some money in there. Yeah. And then we have a VC arm, which is just we when we get to see all these cool companies going through. Mm -hmm. And when we find the perfect company, we'll throw our own money into it. Well, uh, what I mean by the venture studio side of things is I'm seeing more people with development ability, design ability, like taking ideas and just helping them build it all as well. So do you ever well, right. cross yeah, that yeah. line? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. So we have done that for so many years, I can't even explain. Before it was uh, a thing, maybe. Before it was called venture studio. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Google's been doing that for a while too, but uh, yeah. that idea, and we're coming from that entrepreneurship build and understand the tech. Yes. Like if the, best, the best part about that is we had a company come to us recently, like we're an AI company. Woo! And we're, we looked at it and like, this is just a GPT prompt, dude. That's not an AI company. <laughs> <laughs> dude, they, have, a little bit, that wave is a little bit died now. I think like a couple of years ago, you could get away with that. Uh, yes, <laughs> not true. so much now. Well, and you know what? All the GPT uh, companies, they all died last week because of GPTs. Like uh, OpenAI coming up with the GPTs concept, that's going to blow all that out of the water. <laughs> yeah. That's I mean. So it sounds like you've been at this for a while. Like, How long have you been an entrepreneur, that dirty word? How long have you been doing that? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. They, they try, when do you become an entrepreneur? I think it's like a sexually transmitted disease more than it's like a... a I say talent. it's a mental health disease. <laughs> yes, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I don't think there's a time where I wasn't an entrepreneur. Yeah. You know, uh, I've got a 15 year old son and he's like starting companies and selling web. He's selling pheromones online right now. Like, you just, what? it's, <laughs> it's all funny. Uh, but I, I sort of started selling and making stuff when I was a kid. I've never really had a job. That's a, that's a problem. I, you know, yeah. that's not true. I was a tree planter in Northern British Columbia, which is like in Northern Canada. Yeah. Planting and I got really good at it and made a lot of money, but it was very, very hard on the body. And I'm, you know, living in a tent in the snow, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't pleasant at all. Mm. Uh, so I, sound, I put myself to university doing that and then decided to go into music and couldn't find a way to make music work and have a job. So yeah. started, started this company. Boom, boom. I, I think that I always said uh, I've always said there's such a synergy between bands and business and entrepreneurship. It's so similar about like forming the group, finding how you're going to get the thing funded through a record company or self-funding or whatever. Um, so there's so much synergy. And I think people who've done things like that have some level of resilience to try entrepreneurship. Absolutely. You know what? I, I've made this connection. You're probably the first person I could have this intelligent conversation with, which is the connection between the VC world and the mm -hmm. record company. Yes, it's the same. same thing. It's the same thing. It, they were the original VCs in until yeah. the like eighties and nineties when VC was reborn. Yeah, You're just I, I can't believe so. I, I discovered this on my own as I'm listening to. Here's how record companies work. They invest in fifty bands, and one of those bands. Has, I'm like, but this is angel investing. What are you yeah. talking about? Yeah, <laughs> same gig. It's the same thing. It's the yeah, same so thing. You, put, you like scoop up all of these little startups, and you like refuse to fund some of them because you know you you want this other one to succeed, and then you know you're stepping up one. Like it's all the same games that happen in the VC world, or happen happened in the record company world. Mm -hmm. And and like it, you have to convince them that your sound is what people are after, or there's a, you've built enough traction with the following or the social media. And maybe that's a good transition to talk about your social media stuff, but the social media to prove that you're a real legitimate thing. You know, yeah. I, I, with the Beatles, I think it was is it George Martin, he, he had to convince people the Beatles could be a good thing, you know, and could be something that's marketable. You know, literally, so I did this on our first Kickstarter campaign. Uh, when I first started like teaching people how to use Kickstarter and doing it myself, I, uh, it was the same thing that he did for the Beatles, which is he went around to all of the local record stores and bought up all the records and then took the, the price tags off and put them back into circulation. So the first, well, I think it was 50,000 records that got sold. Mm -hmm. It was a thousand records that they actually produced that he just kept buying them up and buying them up and buying them up. Yeah. You know, and you, the same thing, that's the Kickstarter like hacking is you start a Kickstarter yep. and buy your own product to yep. sort of get it to start to start out the road and, and then say, hey, I bought all this stuff. People and sometimes overlook the hustle that's needed in those early days. They think you just pay for some PPC, pay for some ads, and you're going to blow up. Um, you know, Richard Branson did the same stuff in the UK when he started Virgin Records. Like, he was stocking music that the normal people didn't like, but he liked the Rolling Stones and stuff like this. And 
stop the things he believed in. Interesting. Didn't mm -hmm. realize. That. I was there recently that um, uh, there, that there's various music communities. I'm trying to figure out which one. Was it reggae? I'm sorry. I don't. Want, I mean, no disrespect to reggae. I, <laughs> I was reggae or, or derivative thereof. Yeah. And I think those, they're they're open about the fact that they will go buy YouTube views on day one. So yeah. you know, it comes out and. <laughs> And they'll just go pay, you know, some hackers and dead people in Azerbaijan <laughs> to uh, to like to 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 run a hundred thousand views, so they can say I got a hundred thousand views on my first day, where it's actually zero real people, or you know, a couple of hundred. You've people. got to learn to hack hack that algorithm. <laughs> and, they're, and apparently, they're open about it. They're like, I paid for my first hundred thousand just so I could get the ball rolling. I'm like, this is this is angel investing. This is like we had to start like, up. We need to learn from reggae. We're going to say it's reggae. That's what we're going to say. It's the uh, the reggae work. growth hack. They're really nice guys in, in the reggae <laughs> world. So why did you get? Why did you choose? Or when was the time you chose to sort of take social media uh, either seriously or not seriously, as the case may be? Like the thing that got me on the uh, like kind of got me onto you was rectangular. I'm sure that's maybe is that accurate? Is that the kind of peak rectangular? I felt spoke to me as an entrepreneur. Because I felt like that is it. You can't fit into anything else. Uh, you can't exactly. fit into any other kind of... I couldn't get a normal job. You're saying, you know, you, you haven't had a proper job. And I, I, I don't think I could get a proper job now if I tried. I'd probably get yeah, exactly. exactly. So that's you the rectangular have, methodology, is it? Have, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> if you don't feel like you're going to fit in this, you know, square peg in a round hole kind of thing, then you become an entrepreneur because you have no other choice. Yeah. That, that speaks to that concept for sure. And so is that the first sort of social media thing that blew up for you? I think I might be following you a bit before that. But um, I, for me, that felt like the, the blow up for you. Yeah, no, that that for sure. That was, I mean, I went from relative. In, yeah, let me say what, what happened was I released a record last year, super stoked during COVID to release a record, released it and crickets, like crickets. But it was that classic, like I made a product. Why is nobody buying it? I'm literally having the same like, I work for, I work at a marketing company. I'm an owner marketing company. Why, why have I not figured this out? Yeah. So I did the classic CEO thing. I've told the story a few times now, but I just went to YouTube and started watching like, yeah, how do I market? What should I do? And a couple of things broke in my head. One was stop releasing records, start releasing one song every three to six weeks. And I just said, I'm going to release a song every 14th of every month for the rest of my life. I'm just going to, even if it's a crappy song, if it's me and a guitar, I'm going to make that happen. And that's become, yeah. I've got a machine now that does that. Meaning I've got, you know, yeah. every Saturday in a studio and I have my people and I can make and I've got multiple bands I'm playing with now and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So once I got the machine of music being made, and this is all watching YouTube, I, I bumped across this guy, Damien Keys. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen his videos. Not sure, maybe. I'm sure you have. Like, you can't, you can't yeah. miss the guy with a British accent. He's a super good looking guy. And he's that like, sounds like me. I think you're talking yeah, about I know, right? <laughs> super excited about his music theories. Yeah. Um, and he's right. So he was like, dude, everything that you're talking about was wrong. All your theories, they're wrong. Oh, and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. help me through this. He sort of signed. He's got, he now has, I don't know, 50, I don't know how many artists that he's working with, but he's also an entrepreneur. So we kind of connected on this entrepreneur level. And he was like, okay, well, I'll kind of pat you on the head and we'll help you through this little voyage of yours. <laughs> uh, and they signed up for his MBA program and got all you know uh, carried on and just follow, started following his pattern and he was like okay release four times a week no matter what happens record all the stuff in advance and so i did all of that put it all online and he's like dude it all sucks <laughs> i'm like <laughs> dude what do i do and so he's like well fly your ass to nashville which is where he lives and he said i'll give you a couple hours and i'll walk around with you with a camera and we'll, we'll film some stuff. So we did that and instantly got huge traction compared to what a comparatively. So what was that? He I was mean, doing I mean, differently, like just shorter form, was it? Yeah, shorter form, first few seconds of clarity, like this, you know, uh, you know, a great example is I then convinced him to come visit me in New, in New York because uh, I wanted to release Rectangular in Times Square because yeah, you know, Times that. Square that Rectangle. Great. Yeah. And uh, so he agreed. And he and he has his brilliant wife, Ella, came out uh, and uh, I brought my daughter and we went out to Times Square and I'm like, OK, welcome, everybody. I'm releasing Rectangle. He's like, shut up. Nobody wants to hear that. Say I came a thousand kilometers for this, you know, keep people on the on the edge and then yeah. sing the song like no molly, molly coddling people, no long winded. And it took me literally 150 tries uh, to get it the way he wanted and we were there uh -huh. all day 
walking around New York and doing that stuff. That's and then it said, if you do this, it's going to work. We did it 30 million views later. I mean, and there's only a 1.6 or whatever. I think it's 1.8 now on TikTok. But then we had uh, 500,000 on Instagram. Somebody retweeted on Twitter for 7 million. We had, you know, everybody start picking up. H3 picked it up podcast. Yeah. They they went right through it, tore it apart. People redid reverse, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, and you know, I'm I'm still fight. I've now got this meme, which is the guy who traveled all over the place. Yeah. Which is which is pretty fun. That's cool, man. Yeah. So has it has it like just made the music career start going in more the direction you want? As it or has it benefited Tree Frog as well? Uh, it hasn't been a benefit of Tree Frog. It's been a massive pain in the ass for Tree Frog. I oh. mean, everybody there, like we get we get along very well. Uh I, my my team and I, we all love one another. Uh so but we we have things like people leaving negative reviews on Google all the time, which is very dangerous for a company that's a service company. And yeah. it's like, I'm circa one out of five. Oh, well, I mean, sure. T- thanks for uh, ruin- yeah, hurting other people. That that sucks because people's salaries are based on that, right? Yeah. Uh, and then we get people literally showing up, knocking on the door and be like, I just want to make sure this guy is real. Like that happens constantly. Yeah, I mean, so that's that that's hard. I'm gonna say the business, lots of visibility for the business, but not a lot of you know. The odd person says, "Hey, could you build me a website?" But you know, we build fifty thousand dollar websites. We're not yeah. building quick things. Get, go to go to Wix for that. So I, I don't think that's had an effect. I mean, the CEO world, which I live in. I mean, I'm an active speaker on AI and talk about AI and work in the AI space. Yeah, uh, and uh, as a speaker in AI, I'm talking to all the CEOs. They've never heard of me. They're not on TikTok. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. they, people are making this about work for business they're not on tiktok period their kids are or you know people have time are they don't have time yeah so, so is it helping yeah. it's not even helping the speaking stuff yet you haven't seen it kind of transfer it and give you a bit of a higher profile in your speaking world are you doing that through a speaking bureau or a, an agent or you just kind of whatever comes up honestly it's whatever comes up so i'm part of ceo groups uh specifically there's some famous ceo groups one's called tech canada uh, one's called McKay. Uh, so what they are is groups of, uh, this, it's called Vistage in the States. And it's, so it's groups of CEOs of sort of five to $10 million companies and above. And they'll get together and spend a day a month together and do cool, cool stuff together and get to know really, each other really well. And so in that, uh, just because I'm the tech guy, I've been the green haired, crazy tech guy in it for 16 years, I've been part of it. Uh, and so they said, Hey, would you come talk to us about open AI in January? Yeah. I, I went there gave a sort of just a casual like here's what's happening here's what you here's what you should be afraid of here's the issue and now i've done 120 presentations since january that's crazy uh, and as you get paid fairly well so they'll pay me anywhere between five and ten thousand dollars to show up uh that's why i mean i'm going to tell you the secret and nobody else okay. which is like i'm flying all over the place not necessarily for like i, I was in ottawa yesterday i'm going to niagara falls in a few hours I'm yeah. in, uh, uh, you know, I'm in all these cities. And so while I'm there, I'm like, might as well go to this. <laughs> like uh-huh. I went to Victoria, which is the other part of Canada. I didn't go there for the butterfly gardens. I just went to the butterfly gardens while I was in Victoria. <laughs> That's awesome. No, I saw the yeah. butterfly one just recently. I was just checking in on you <laughs> and I saw the butterfly one. That's so cool. You yeah. Go. No, you got a, you got to blend the two. And obviously the, the backgrounds are so compelling and it tells the story more, doesn't it as well? Um, yeah. I think the speaking stuff can be really good for an entrepreneur uh, to get, you know, to hopefully help the business as well. I, I've done a lot of speaking over the years and just before COVID, I actually got into a speaking bureau and I got my first gig booked. And then when COVID happened, I was going to be speaking in Fiji uh, and then it got canceled because of COVID. And I was going to get like that kind of money, like you say, but yeah, I've been doing a lot of speaking with uh, Virgin for a number of years, Virgin Startup and Richard Branson's companies and got to do some cool stuff there. But um, yeah, I think I'm going to do some more speaking probably next year, kind of ramp that up a little bit. You know, as a guy who loves being the center of attention and on stage, et cetera, like I just, I grew up in that. And I should probably validate why. I'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. But I love speaking because I get to show up. I know the stuff, you know, cold. Because after you've given a hundred presentations oh, in yeah. front of, hard-boiled CEOs, they've eaten you alive time after time after time. You know all the answers to all the questions that any CEO is going to ask, really. And if you don't, you can say, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll find it. You go find it, and then you have the answer for all future speaking gigs. It's great. Um, so that, that's that's a good deal for me. But I do like being that sort of center of attention guy. So, mm-hmm. uh, and that came from, here's, here's my, my reason for that. I grew up in Angola. Well, I was born in Canada, 
then moved to the Civil War in Angola when I was a kid. Uh, and I, you know, when you see like a baby capybara, you're like, oh, it's I don't so know if I've seen that. <laughs> right. But if you did, you can imagine your head. Okay. You, you'd want to look that out and put it in its hold it for a while because it's so cute. Yeah. You imagine the baby animal version of everything with mm-hmm. the exception of maybe a Tyrannosaurus Rex. But even that is probably cute, like a baby Tyrannosaurus Rex. Most baby so, things are cute. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I moved to Canada when I was from Canada to Angola when I was a kid it, during the Civil War. And now Civil War basically just started. And I was the only white kid that anyone had ever seen. Mm-hmm. So anywhere I'd go with my parents, I just got mobbed by people always looking at me, always being stared at. So I just got used to constantly being the center of attention and constantly being stared at. Mm-hmm. And as a result, fast forward a little bit, and uh, I have like... A personality that just I'm not, it feels weird if I'm walking down the street and people aren't staring at me. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It's your origin story. It's your villain origin story. Now I had a similar, I had a, I had a, I had a similar one where so my two excuses. I had a similar thing to you. I wasn't the only white kid, but I grew up in Qatar in the '90s for a bit, and so really? when we walked through the streets. The people would try and touch us because I'm blonde hair, blue eyes. Like people would want to touch me and my sister. Um. And mine was, I, I was, I am, and I was dyslexic at school. So I was used to failing over and over again and looking silly and looking stupid to the point I just didn't care anymore. And I would just get up and talk and, and I, and I would have to compensate not being able to spell and read too good <laughs> with being able to talk and articulate myself better. So that's my villain origin story. That's a good villain origin. I like that. We have, we have very similar. Look at that. So you yeah. start off with a sort of like spectrum child issue as a result of being in a different country and having different dynamics around you, but gain a whole bunch of other abilities that your standard school system doesn't give you. Mm-hmm. And one of them is being the center of attention. So you end up becoming a stage person that you yeah. like to be on stage. It's not even like to be on stage. I just, I don't have any, I, I can stand on stage in front of one or a thousand or 10,000 or a hundred thousand people and it doesn't bug me. There's like, a, there's like no, what, what the, where most people get up there and get nervous. I mean, you get a little bit nervous, but yeah. it's, it's more excitement there, right? It's probably exc- yeah, yeah. Kind of excited about it. The only thing I don't like to be is I don't like to be, if I'm, if people know I'm going up there and I'm just coming up top of my head, then I'm fine. But if I know it needs to be prepped and I feel like I haven't prepped well enough, because I want to make sure I deliver that. That's the, when you can, so what I started doing with my public speaking, I spoke at South by Southwest uh, last year. Uh, and I, and it was, that was an amalgamation of years of prepping for a talk not just talking about me or entrepreneurship broadly but like a subject so i was speaking about no code app development because one of my companies is a no code tool not like oh. wix like we do offer like um enterprise it's like google forms on steroids we work with enterprise customers to find that and um so i was talking about no code and it was people from Airtable in the room and it was people from webflow in the room who were like senior staff so i had to kind of speak knowledgeably about these things so the pressure for me is when I'm right. Okay, I've had plenty of time to prep for this, so I want to just do myself, do good by myself, and deliver this content well. And I've started doing like more, um, like yeah, just just like ready-made decks. So if I have to do a talk and I need it to be prepped, and so mine has been around kind of the, in a way, villain origin story. I kind of bring in kind of everyone's fallen in love with superheroes these days, and we're now moving into a world where we're going to have superhuman powers, where we're going to have access to AI and stuff like. So, yeah, when I was at school and very dyslexic, I, your teacher would say, well, Matt, you need to learn this mental arithmetic because you're not going to have a calculator in your pocket when you go out. I was like, well, I've got an iPhone, so joke's on you. But we've now we've got, we've got an encyclopedia in our pocket. We've got a calculator. And although we have to commit things to memory to a certain degree, that's not what dictates intelligence. And it's creative problem solving nowadays. Uh, and things are going to, we're going to continue to augment our body. And at the moment, these phones are in our pocket. But over time, we're going to see Elon Musk's kind of, you know, inner brain things. And we'll be able to get chat GPT or whatever plumbed in that way. So we're looking for people who are like you and me, who have just got used to figuring out problems quickly and creative solutions to ideas. That's why. I that's it. Yeah. yeah. Ex- ex- no, no, no. I'm not completely sure that Elon Musk's wet thing is necessary, given that EEGs, we get, you know, we can go down a whole tech thing here. Oh, this is, a, that's another podcast. Ask like, back and forth fairly easy we should do one just on yeah. tech you yeah. know, be fun. I don't, like listen this 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 is like I, you just started like five different podcast ideas in the last five we have minutes. it's dangerous <laughs> i love it yeah uh, man yeah there's so many things we could talk about i'm conscious that you, you know you've got lots of meetings on today and you've got a flight where are you flying today to uh well driving to niagara falls about five oh. hours away 
Well, there'll yeah, be another yeah. video coming out soon, I'm sure. Of you <laughs> falls. So it's a sneak <laughs> peek there. That's a good job. That's so, man, thank you for your time on the recorded part of this podcast, but we can talk after this and decide if we want to talk more about tech some other time as well. Sounds Thanks, great. Sir. Thanks, sir. Enjoy. Thanks.